to welcome our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Jelaine Lewis, fresh off of her sabbatical, uh, is with us here today. She's an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at the University of Lynchburg. She completed her undergraduate degree in Communication and Religion at Randolph-Macon Women's College and her Master of Science in Journalism from Florida A&M University. Her PhD in Media and Communication is from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand and her Graduate Certificate in Higher Education is from Monash University in Australia. This is her eighth year at the university where she teaches communication Africana studies classes. She's also the advisor for the university's campus newspaper, The Critograph, and is a trainer with the University of Lynchburg's National Coalition Building Institute team. Dr. Lewis is also the Pierce Street Gateway Executive Director and founding member for the Pierce Street Community Garden. She serves on the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank and the Link Project Boards and on the Exhibition Committee for the Legacy Museum of African American History. Dr. Lewis's love well of travel and passion for the classroom has taken her on adventures around the globe. Her research interest is focused on the linkages between new media, global politics, and policy. Her presentation, One Hand Can't Clap, news coverage of China's environmental impact in the Caribbean, explores the complexities of the media coverage of China's development projects, environmental impact in the region. Welcome, Dr. Joanne Lewis. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. I told Jeff I didn't think anybody was going to come. <laughs> okay. So in the past few months, we've been inundated with news about China, particularly as we consider their partnerships with Russia and the conflict in Ukraine. Newspapers around the world have covered everything from China's military base in Cuba to youth unemployment, to diplomatic relations with the US. And while all of these are important things to look at, I thought I would start a little closer to home. So for a little bit of context, I am a daughter of the Caribbean. I was born in Guyana, which is the only English-speaking country in South America, and I grew up in Jamaica. I am West Indian, and I'm always proud about it. So for those of you who don't know, the region spans 28 countries and is home to about 44 million citizens, with Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic having the largest populations. As with many tourism countries, tourism dependent countries in the global south, there's mass income inequality, and about 30% of the region lives below the poverty rate. The Caribbean is truly a diverse community with a multiplicity of ethnic groups and belief systems. Many descriptions about the region, especially as somebody from the region, can feel a little reductive. While it's undeniably beautiful, and it's the perfect vacation spot, for generations these countries have been home to people with complex histories, and in many instances have been shaped by colonization, starting with Christopher Columbus and slavery, and indentured servantship, and what at times can feel like a very exploitative tourism industry. Chinese migration to the Caribbean began in the mid 19th century when Chinese laborers were brought to supplement income, on, supplement labor on sugar plantations after the abolition of slavery. This migration is part of a broader system of indentured labor, particularly in countries like Jamaica, Trinidad, and Guyana. Over time, Ch Chinese migrants established small businesses and became integrated into Caribbean society, contributing to the region's cultural diversity. In recent decades, migration from China has continued but the focus has shifted to business and investment. Chinese entrepreneurs and companies have increasingly participated in major construction projects, infrastructure development, and trade, particularly in countries like Jamaica, the Bahamas, and Antigua, where Chinese businesses have substantial influence in tourism and construction sectors. 
This contemporary migration reflects China's growing economic influence. So in 2013, President Xi Jinping of China announced a new double trade corridor to reopen channels between China and its neighbors in Central Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. The Belt and Road Initiative is seen as a global development strategy launched to enhance trade and economic growth through infrastructure development. By investing in transportation, energy, and communication infrastructure, China hopes to facilitate global trade and bolster economic ties, particularly with the participating countries. The BRI is often referred to as the New Silk Road, and it's integral for China's foreign policy strategy. So much so that a reference was added to the, China, to the Communist Party's constitution in 2017. Through the BRI, Chinese banks and companies fund and build roads, power plants, ports, railway, railways, 5G networks, and fiber optic cables around the world. So far, at least 215 cooperation documents have been signed with 150 countries and 30 international organizations signing on. More than 61 have been signed since 2018. From roads to, and power plants in Pakistan and high-speed rail in Indonesia, hotels and bridges in Guyana, and hospitals and stadiums in Dominica, Beijing is everywhere. China has ushered in a new era of globalization with hopes to send, spend about $8 trillion on infrastructure grants. Critics argue that these grants are creating a dependency on Chinese loans, leading to concerns about debt sustainability and geopolitical influence. Despite these critiques, many countries welcome the BRI as an opportunity to enhance their economic development and improve global, global connectivity. China is also promoting cooperation in education, in science, and in digital technology, further strengthening its soft power and global influence and shaping the new economic and diplomatic ties around the region. So some of us might ask, why the Caribbean? Caribbean markets are generally small. Most of the nations need more sizable reserves in terms of minerals and other, and other raw materials that would generally draw the Chinese, for example, like in Africa. However, the region is strategically an important hub in terms of logistics, it holds economic uh, significance, it offers access to natural resources, and has key shipping lanes. And it's a growing market for Chinese goods and services. In addition, the geographic location of the Caribbean and its growing economic potential makes the region strategically important for China in terms of banking and infrastructure. It is home to a variety of offshore financial institutions and offers opportunities for Chinese investment and financial services expansion, i.e. places to hide money. <laughs> the Caribbean's proximity to the US allows China to extend its geopolitical influence in a region traditionally dominated by Western powers. In addition, the area could have vast security value, particularly because of its proximity to the US. So I thought I'd pull out about six reasons why the Chinese are making these investments in the region. And the first one is economic. So China has invested significantly in the Caribbean, focusing on infrastructure projects. Then we've got strategic partnerships, where we're seeing a lot of bilateral trade and economic cooperation agreements drawn up with a lot of these small island developing countries. And then you've got economic exchanges. Lots of Caribbean people used to go to school in the States or in the UK, 
and now the Chinese are providing scholarships for them to come and study in China. You've also got infrastructure development and tourism sector development. Because most of the regional income is in tourism, Chinese have made heavy investments in, resort, in resorts and tourism infrastructure in an effort to boost economic ties. Now with all of this investment comes some amount of resource extraction. They're engaged in mining and natural resource extraction, particularly in countries like Guyana, which yes, is contributing to economic growth, but is also having a huge environmental impact. And then the last one is diplomatic influence through financial aid and loans and training programs, which helps to bolster them in the region. So in September 2015, during the UN General Assembly, the Sustainable Development Goals were launched as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So there are 17 goals, and five of them directly relate to climate change and environmental degradation. Goal six, which is clean water and sanitation. Goal seven, affordable and clean energy. Goal 13, on climate change. Goal 14, on life below water. Goal 15, on life on land. And so the goals encourage sustainable environmental practices that should ensure that we have a planet that is secure for future generations. And the region is working collaboratively with stakeholders in the states to ensure that we achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals, focusing on environmental sustainability, economic development, and social progress. The Caribbean's vulnerability to climate change, natural disasters, and economic dependence on tourism has led to joint efforts to promote renewable energy, improve disaster resilience, and foster inclusive growth among partners here in the States and those in the region. The programs are supported by the US and by a bevy of international agencies with the hope to enhance regional capacity around areas like infrastructure development and uh, biodiversity preservation and climate adaptation. So as we saw this summer with Hurricane Barrel in Grenada and St. Vincent, the Caribbean is incredibly vulnerable to rising sea levels and natural disasters. With the destruction of mangroves and deforestation, Islands are more likely to experience devastation in the event of storm surges, high winds, and erosion. Similarly, with transportation and tourism development, this is often meant the removal of natural vegetation along the shore and the destruction of marine ecosystems. Many Caribbean economies rely heavily on tourism and a limited range of exports such as agriculture and minerals. This narrow economic base makes them highly susceptible to external shocks, including global economic downturns and changes in commodity prices and natural disasters. When these industries are affected, it leads to significant economic instability <coughs> and revenue loss. Drug trafficking and organized crime pose significant threats to the stability and security of the region. These illicit activities undermine the rule of law, weaken governmental institutions, and foster corruption at various levels of society. As a result, the legitimacy of legal and political institutions have been compromised, leading to diminished public trust and governance challenges. Environmental degradation, such as coral reef, coral reef destruction, beach erosion, and deforestation, directly impacts the natural attractions that draws tourists to the region. The loss of these natural resources leads to the decline in tourism revenue and adversely affects local businesses, employment, and overall economic stability. These threats, combined with rising income inequality, import bills are some of, and import bills are some of the issues facing Caribbean governments. So, in order to stymie some of this, 
governments have chosen to look at a new economic space around the blue economy. So they're working to manage their marine ecosystems more effectively, tackle overfishing, reduce pollution, and strengthen coastal re resilience against climate change, while also attracting foreign investment to expand infrastructure in what's hopefully a sustainable manner. So Gunther Pauli is the father of this idea of the blue economy. And it's the concept that Caribbean governments have adopted in an attempt to grow their economies. So it rests on, on three main themes. Four main themes. Uh, sustainable and inclusive growth and development, reducing the risk of over-exploitation and risky methods of extraction and usage of the ocean's resources, enhancing the welfare of coastal communities in terms of economic opportunities and social protection. So they're trying to ensure the resilience of these countries through the, to natural disasters and trying to somehow stymie the impact of climate change. And so while blue economy initiatives exist around the region, their scope and scale remain below their true potential mainly because it hasn't been formally recognized as an essential economic driver. So far, Grenada is at the forefront of this economic transformation with its Blue Growth Coastal Master Plan, which identifies opportunities for blue growth development in areas such as fisheries, aquaculture, aquaponics, blue, blue biotechnology, research, and innovation. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on Antigua and Jamaica. So these countries straddle the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean and have vastly different populations and economic pressures. In Jamaica, the population is almost 3 million, while in Antigua, it's just over 100,000. While both are parliamentary democracies that still <laughs> fly the British flag, um, the GDPs are vastly different. Unemployment rates are vastly different. And inflation rates, despite the unemployment rates, are running neck and neck as of last year. Stakeholders in Jamaica note that it's yet to fully benefit from its exclusive economic zone, which would be their blue economy zone. Even though the economy includes tourism, recreation and leisure, scenic ocean views, and an environment that supports food security through a fishery sub-industry. The blue economy in Jamaica in 2020 contributed $2.5 billion in added value. And in 2021, there are more than 500,000 jobs tied to the blue economy sector in Jamaica, which was 37% of the labor force. However, overfishing, marine litter, plastic, dying coral reefs remain its biggest issues. And despite actions to control plastic use, because they've banned plastic in Jamaica and moved to paper everything, further actions are required to manage the sustainability of the blue economy on the island. In Antigua, their exclusive economic zone is about 11, 000, uh, 111,000 kilometers, which supports several marine economic sectors and contributes significantly to, the na to their national GDP. Again, it relies heavily on tourism, but it's got sectors such as coastal and marine space, and they do a lot of fishing, maritime transport, water management, and mineral extraction. But despite its reliance on marine sectors, less than 1% of the marine waters of Antigua and Barbuda are protected. The government of Antigua and Barbuda understands its dependence on ocean spaces and is actively working to increase the protection 
of inshore areas. The island also has major issues around plastic pollution, overfishing, and climate change. So what they've done in Antigua is that they've enacted an Environmental Protection and Management Act. They've revised their Fisheries Act, and it was the first place in the region to ban plastic bags in 2016. Around the world, Antigua is recognized for working towards creating a sustainable, well-rounded blue economy. In 2021, they implemented a national ocean policy, which is a key step in strengthening their ocean's governance and supporting sustainable development. But let's get back to China in the region. So while it's important to talk about the environment, we've got to think, why is China investing in the region? So China's had about 50 years of diplomatic relations with Jamaica. Bilateral trade increased from 58 million in 2000 to 1.172 billion dollars in 2023. Jamaica is China's largest partner in the English-speaking Caribbean. Beijing has invested in roads, roads, four roads, uh, to the tune of about 800 million US dollars just on roads. They've made additional investments in a deep water container port, tourism, bauxite, and sugar. The one drawback of this investment is the limited use of local labor and materials as Chinese firms import their labor from China to complete these projects. Jamaica's National Environment and Planning Agency has expressed concerns about the environmental impact of the Chinese-backed infrastructure projects on the island, <coughs> particularly regarding compliance with environmental regulations. For example, there have been concerns about bauxite mining and infrastructure development, a lot around water contamination and around deforestation. What you're finding in Jamaica is that we are substituting uh, progress for damage to, sen to sensitive ecosystems. And so the National Environment and Planning Agency is really working to try to enforce the guidelines, the national guidelines around environmental protection. But remember we talked about corruption? So they're facing a lot of pushback in trying to adhere to some of the local laws and regulations. In Antigua, China has invested heavily in agriculture, in education, and infrastructure. They built the Sir Vivian Richards Stadium, which is where we play cricket in Antigua, and the VC Bird Air Terminal. They're currently working on building an offshore medical university, a hotel, and a financial center in a special economic zone at Crabs, which is on 100 acres of land that the Antiguan government has given to the Chinese. A tourism and casino complex situated on Guyana Island is also under construction. This is $2 billion of investment. Many local conservationists are worried about the project. The project is occurring around the Northeast uh, Marine Management Area in Antigua, it's illegal to destroy mangroves along the coast, but aerial photography has shown the destruction of mangroves. And according to locals, this is going to affect drastically their fishing industry. So for this project, what I did was look at four uh, local newspapers. I'm really passionate about geopolitics in the region, but I think I'm even more obsessed with the newspapers. And in the Caribbean, what you have is a very engaged civil society. We don't like a government, we get rid of it. We don't like the new one, we get rid of that one too. But newspapers have been at the heart of telling the stories of China's growing influence in the region. One of the great things about living in the Caribbean is its high level of press freedom. 
According to Reporters Without Borders, Jamaica ranks 32 of 180 nations in terms of press freedom, and Antigua ranks number 75. So for some context, the US is number 45, and New Zealand is 13. So in Jamaica, I looked at the Jamaica Gleaner. The Jamaica Gleaner was first published in 1834, and it's the oldest a uh, continuously published newspaper in the Western Hemisphere. And it's considered the newspaper of record for Jamaica. I also looked at the Jamaica Observer and in Antigua, the Antigua Newsroom and the Antigua Observer. So what I did was that I analyzed articles around uh, Chinese involvement on the island and the environmental impact of the infrastructure uh, projects, particularly looking at it through the lens of Habermas's public sphere theory. So this theory uh, emphasizes how public discourse can shape political action and policy. And it's used to consider how public discussions in these Caribbean newspapers cover how Chinese investments and their environmental impact are facilitated, restricted, and at many times ignored. So I consider how stakeholders, including governments, nonprofits, organizations, local communities, media, and media engage in dialogue about environmental concerns and how this influences local policy decisions and public opinion. So these are some of the headlines from regional newspapers as newsrooms have consistently weighed in on regional agreements and disagreements with Chinese firms and a flurry of lawsuits from these companies. So what I did was that I ended up with 1,452 articles from 2011 to 2014, I mean 2024, that focused solely on the environmental impact of Chinese investments in the region. In Jamaica, there's been a marked increase in China coverage since the signing of the BRI in 2018. However, discussions about environmental impact date back to 2013 and the Goat Island project off the coast of Jamaica. The Jamaican government announced plans to develop a major transshipment port in collaboration with China Harbor Engineering Company within the Portland Bright protected area, which includes the Goat Islands. This sparked immediate concern from environmental groups and from the public on the island. They highlighted the potential ecological damage, including a threat to endangered species and the disruption of vital habitats. The controversy intensified over the following years, leading to widespread protests and debates about balancing development with environmental preservation. Because of the pushback from civil society, the Jamaican government decided to protect the Ghost <coughs> Islands, establishing a wildlife sanctuary instead of proceeding with the development. Other projects haven't fared as well. The newspapers revealed slight significant concerns about the Alpert Alumina refinery. Locals have reported that Chinese owned bauxite and alumina. Locals have reported the Chinese owned bauxite and alumina refinery for dust pollution, poor waste management, and concerns over water quality in nearby rivers. The recently completed North South Highway, also built by the China Harbor Engineering Company, has also faced scrutiny. Environmental concerns have been raised about deforestation the disruption of natural ha habitats, and an adequate compensation for affected communities. At the Kingston Container Terminal, China Harbor Engineering Company's expansion has prompted worries about coastal and marine ecosystem disruption, especially in terms of mangrove destruction and potential impacts on marine, li marine life. While this is not an exhaustive List, they're the ones that have sparked 70% of the conversations about environmental impact in the Jamaica Gleaner and the Jamaica Observer. So some of the emerging team themes from the 
newspapers in Jamaica has to do with accessibility and inclu inclusivity. So there's a dearth of information about the Chinese companies who are spearheading these projects. Many times, Chinese consulate, now there's an embassy on island, is responding to local concerns. There's also a lack of ordinary citizens being included in the discussions. It's mainly driven by civil society and government instead of the local communities affected. Both newsrooms appear to be walking a tightrope regarding the depth of the discourse around environmental issues as they try to balance how to navigate policy discussions versus public perceptions. So in Antigua, two, uh, 241 articles were from the Antiguan Observer and the Antigua Newsroom that focused on environmental concerns. So the Yida project on Guyana Island in Antigua is where this large scale development is taking place and it's spearheaded by a Chinese investor called Yida Zhang. And the project broke ground in 2014 and it involves seven, four, $740 million in investment to transform the area into a mixed use tourism focused development. So the plan includes five-star hotels, residential units, a casino, a conference center, and a 27-hole golf course and marina. So the, this project in particular is currently facing litigation. Mind you, we've been in construction since 2014. It should almost be done. But they're in court and the project is stalled because of a multitude of environmental and legal violations. It has raised significant environmental concerns, including the unauthorized clearing of land, the removal of mangroves, and illegal sand mining, all of which breach local environmental laws. Additionally, traditional access for local fishers has been obstructed by the, develop, the developer. And critical habitats, including turtle nesting sites and areas for vulnerable species have been disturbed without proper environmental impact assessments. While much further along than the Goat Island project in Jamaica, we've seen Antiguan environmentalists and civil society push back on the execution of this project. The, in, the Antiguan observe, in the Antiguan newspapers, 20% of the articles analyzed were editorials. Many highlighted the disruption of marine life from dredging and construction activities for the deep water harbor expansion, which would directly harm marine life on the island. But there are also concerns about pollution associated with the building of a deep water harbor. Tourism is central to Antigua's GDP. So while there's overarching support for airport improvements, civil society share concerns about coastal habitat displacement of species that rely on the area for breeding and feeding. So the Antigua newspapers highlighted that local communities feel excluded from meaningful participation in the decision-making processes around Chinese investments projects. So there's several instances, particularly with the Yida project, where community meetings or consultations were either insufficient or not held at all. This lack of engagement contradicts the ideals of Habermas's public sphere, where public discourse and active citizen participation are essential for democratic decision making. The absence of local voices, in the planning stages of projects can lead to a sense of disenfranchisement and mistrust among residents, undermining the legitimacy of these developments. In Antigua, what we see is an ongoing tension about the economic benefits of Chinese investments and the associated environmental costs. The articles may present arguments from both proponents and critics of these projects showcasing the economic incentives such as job creation and infrastructure development 
versus the long-term environmental degradation. This dichotomy reflects a key aspect of the public sphere, where the development of societal interests and values are debated. The newspapers in Antigua have provided a platform for diverse perspectives and fostered a more nuanced understanding of the complex trade-off involved in some of these conversations. So I always like to look at the comments, particularly in, in online newspapers. And when you look at the comment sections in the articles about, about around environmental concerns with these Chinese infrastructure projects, there are four main themes that emerge. When you look at the themes around Habermas's public sphere theory, what you see is the environmental degradation and public health concern. So a lot of commenters express alarm over the negative impacts of local ecosystems and potential health risks associated with it. They discuss quality of life issues, particularly in terms of job creation, overfishing, and long-term sustainability. Habermas suggests that such discourse is vital for the public to articulate and address collectively, thereby hopefully influences, influencing long-term public policy decisions. In terms of economic development versus environmental uh, preservation, this is another recurring theme that we see in the, news, in the newsrooms. Some commenters argue that infrastructure projects bring necessary economic benefits to the region and they create job opportunities, while others contend that these benefits come with too high of a cost, particularly for the environment. So this debate exemplifies public sphere as a space for balancing different interests and values encouraging a democratic dialogue and encouraging a democratic dialogue on sustainable development. There's also an ongoing tension around government transparency and accountability. Both islands, on both islands, citizens criticize the lack of transparency and accountability in the government's dealings with Chinese firms. Commenters call for more public consultation and better enforcement of environmental regulations. Now, according to Habermas, if functioning public sphere requires transparency and accountability from authorities by allowing citizens to hold their leaders accountable and participate in a really meaningful way in governance. <coughs> On these islands, there are issues of cultural and sovereignty concerns. People are concerned about the idea of the recolonization of the region by the Chinese and the erosion of, natural, of national sovereignty and the cultural impact this is going to have because they believe that Chinese investments might undermine local control and local heritage. The last thing that I want us to think about is these are themes that are emerging from the online versions of the paper. So we've got to think about things like access and education. And while these are highly educated societies, a lot of people who read newspapers online tend to be people who don't actually live in these places. And so we have to think about the nuance around that when we look at common sections. So the impact of Chinese influence in Jamaica and in Antigua, I think it's multifaceted and complex. So while China is contributing significantly to infrastructure development, and it provides aid, and it offers vaccines and access to education, I think regional concerns about environmental practices and the benefits gained from trade agreements is breeding a lot of local apprehension. The newspapers reveal that Beijing is keenly aware of the local and international tensions, particularly with the US, and actively manages its public image around environmental issues by having a central message 
usually through its embassies and consulates. This balancing act between entre entrepreneurial ambitions and philanthropic efforts requires a nuanced understanding of their role in the region. The economies of Jamaica and Antigua are struggling with job creation, declining foreign direct investment, and increasing social demands. They are immensely pressured to develop sustainable economies. Currently, China offers essential support, although questions remain about its long-term geopolitical goals. As China expands its global influence, strategic alliances and debt obligations may soon become apparent, particularly in international voting bodies like the United Nations. From Habermas's public sphere theory perspective, the discourse surrounding Chinese influence in the Caribbean highlights the importance of inclusive and open communication among citizens. These islands have a public sphere where individuals can discuss and influence political action, which is vital in addressing their long-term survival and sustainability. The active engagement and deliberation by local communities, media, and policymakers can help to ensure that Chinese development and investments align with Jamaica and Antigua's sustainable development and environmental preservation goals. That's it, guys. Woo!